arrived in Tokyo, uh, Haneda Airport. The sun was coming up, and then it really hit me. I have no idea where I'm going. And uh, miracles happened. Just miracles happened. Hey there. Thanks for tuning in. This is episode 244 of A Whistle Kick of Martial Arts Radio. My name is Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host here for the show. I'm the founder of Whistle Kick Sparring Gear and Apparel. And if you couldn't guess, I'm a pretty passionate martial artist. We make this show, we have this company where we make products, sparring gear, apparel, and a growing line of other things, because the martial arts is awesome. I owe so much of my life to it, but we're not here to talk about me. We're here to talk about today's guest, Anshu Stephen Hayes. If you've ever done any research or bumped into anything on ninjutsu, if you want to check out everything that we do, the best place to start is whistlekick.com. If you want to check out the other 243 episodes of this show, you can find them at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We have show notes over there with photos. You can sign up for the newsletter, links to our guests, social media, and all kinds of other great stuff. It really is a good place to go. If you're a fan of the show, it'll bring you that much deeper into who our guests are, the subjects that we have for our Thursday shows, and just a whole bunch of other great stuff. I want to thank you again for tuning in. Thank you to all of you who share the show, who have signed up for the newsletter, who write in with your comments and your feedback. It all means a tremendous amount to me, and I appreciate the time that you put in to helping this show, this community grow. We've featured a couple of guests who traveled to Japan to pursue their martial arts career, and our guest today is another one of those. He is Anshu Stephen Hayes, known by many as an American authority on ninjutsu. He's an exciting person to listen to, which made me lose track of the time when we were talking. His martial arts story is inspiring. From his humble beginnings in Ohio, where nobody taught martial arts when he was a child, to where he is now, having traveled and taught throughout the world. Let's welcome him. Anshu Hayes, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hey, it's great to be here. It is great to have you here. I am looking forward to learning more about you. You're someone that, you know, I've... I've I've always known a little bit about you're you're spoken of in circles and and I've seen you at at um, Alan Goldberg's event and I'm excited to learn some more about you but I've got to ask because it it's it's a title I've never heard before what is what is Anshu what is the I guess lineage or history on that Well <laughs> that, yeah, actually that's a funny question uh, Anshu is a title that was created for me back in 1996. Uh, it's kind of a long story. Is that okay? That is quite, we, we have, I have all the time in the world. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, I, for years, practiced a classical ninja martial art in Japan. And, you know, I always knew I would have to come back to America. And when I came back to America in uh, 1980, you know, the, the truth is people, fought differently. People fight differently in 21st century America than they did in 15th century Japan. And I knew I would have to modernize. We're going to keep the principles the same, but change maybe the attacks, um, uh, make it more relevant. So in 1996, I created a new martial art called Toshindo. And, uh, people said to me, uh, well, you need a title. You need a title. I said, oh, you know, I can just be Stephen Hayes. And they said, no, nah, no, nah, you need a title. Uh, something that is going to sound impressive. And, uh, you know, maybe you could be Dai Shihan, the great master. Or, uh, I said, oh, come on, that sounds so pretentious. Um, so <laughs> I came up with An Shu. An is a very small, like, retreat hut in japan it's where a warrior or a uh, monk would go to leave behind the world and just kind of regenerate his powers or his uh, focus or his strength and uh so the on is actually my my house my home um and uh it's called the kasumi on kasumi means haze h-a-z-e and that's associated with the ninja lore of Japan uh, um, pretty predominantly. But it's a play on words for H-A-Y-E-S, Hayes and Hayes, sure. on, 
And Shu is like the person in charge of. So my title translates as the person in charge of the retreat hut. (laughs) But, you know, it's funny, though, (laughs) because there are a couple of people who saw that title and they they style themselves as ninja. Now, they don't have a real lineage. But anyway, you don't need a lineage right now. I needed lineage when I came back, but anybody can say they're a ninja now and everybody goes with it. And anyway, so people have copied that thinking it means great ninja master or (laughs) something (laughs) something like that. But it's actually the caretaker of the retreat hut. And uh, uh, that's my, uh, that's how I got my title. I love it. It sounds so impressive. It sounds so grandiose but there's <laughs> such humility in that title i i just it's fantastic um yeah and and if the rest of our conversation today are these sorts of stories then you can take all the time in the world that you want because <laughs> i was chuckling right along with you there that was fantastic okay. now we well, just got we, we yeah Actually, there's another title that we use for the practitioners of our martial art, and that is Toshi. Toshi. To is sword, and she would mean, uh, oh, like, I mean, sounds kind of funny, but it's like knight, K N I G H T. So it's the she of Bushi, uh, which Japanese martial artists might recognize as another term for samurai. So Toshi, when a person gets to third degree black belt in our martial art, they're actually given a unique Toshi name. There's a Japanese kanji that's put on the beginning of that Toshi, and uh, um, everyone is different. You know, in English, we only have 26 letters, so there are a couple that sound the same in English, but in Japanese, there's a unique kanji for everybody. Uh, who makes it to third degree. And those are the only two titles we have in our uh, martial art. Anshu, the retreat hut caretaker, and this uh, Toshi, which uh, anybody who's got, you know, the desire and the time and uh, get through all the frustrations, uh, they can earn this Toshi title. Mm. It sounds like you were very thoughtful in creating the style as, as you came back from Japan. Is that you're a, a, a cerebral type, a, a thinker. Is that fair? <laughs> well, yeah, that's fair. That's fair. You know, I think, uh, geez, how to phrase this without offending people. Ah, uh, what the heck? <laughs> you uh, go, go for it. <laughs> go for it. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, in, a, in America, God, there's so many, flamboyant wild titles and all this kind of stuff and you look and a person has maybe you know 20 students and uh but they've got this grandiose title and wild looking belts and you know i just thought for an american audience we just keep it simple and just keep it simple um you qualify as a toshi and you carry that for the rest of your uh training days uh i don't know you know when i get old and fall over on the mat i tell all my students when i get old and just fall over just drag me off the mat and keep training Uh, but uh you know what kind of title would uh, the new head of toshindo be called anshu or you know maybe they would have a different title um but i'm 68 right now and i figure i got about 30 more years so we'll we'll work that out later on Absolutely. Now you mentioned going to Japan, you mentioned coming back and clearly there's a, there's a before there's a a prequel to what you just told us. So let's roll back. How did you get started in the martial arts? Well, you know, when I was a small child growing up in Dayton, Ohio, um, I saw a couple of TV shows uh, I mean, this is way back in the ancient days when there were just three TV channels. Um, but they featured martial arts. And uh, this was only like 10 years after World War II. And uh, 
you know, martial arts were something very exotic, uh, almost forbidden. This just electrified my little spirit. Um, you know, I'd been to school. I went to a, you know, a typical middle class Midwestern school. Uh, there were no gangs in those days. But, you know, we had a couple of bullies that would pick on kids. And, you know, I didn't think that was right. Uh, I didn't get picked on myself, but I saw other kids picked on. And but I, I didn't know how to how to how to deal with that. I didn't know how to hold myself with command. I didn't know how to. uh you know, fight if somebody took a poke at me. Um, so the martial arts represented uh, a body of knowledge that I could learn. I could become one where, you know, normally I was intelligent and articulate. But, hey, if I got dragged down to the gutter, I could emerge uh, on top from that. And that became like an obsession. Um when I was a small child, uh, I remember a time in the fourth grade, I, my mom took me to the library and I looked in the card catalog and they had like three judo books. Oh man, I was going to get these judo books and study those and uh, try to teach myself. <laughs> and, but I couldn't find the books. And so we went to the counter and we asked the person and they said, Oh, those books aren't out on the, on the regular uh, stacks. We said, they're not, no, they're not. Uh, those are on a special shelf in the back. Uh, the, the manager of the library, um, uh, has those cause they're, they're kind of dangerous. <laughs> yeah. They really said that. So my, I couldn't check them out as a fourth grader. My mom had to, uh, actually check out the, uh, the books for me (laughs) is that deadly it was that deadly and uh you know i got some friends and we tried to teach ourselves judo in the backyard i mean i i was obsessed i was obsessed uh with learning the martial arts only problem was no schools in uh dayton ohio back in those days Mm. so here you are I mean, this, this is like straight out of a movie. Here you are, you know, a child with an interest and you find these ancient tomes of wisdom, but you know, <laughs> you, 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 you're not, you're not in the inner sanctum. So you're not allowed to read them or, or you need the codex to decode them or something, right? There, there's a, there's a movie plot here. I think you got it. You yeah. know, I, you know, I'll, I laugh when I say this, but. You know, all these cornball ninja movies that came out in the 80s and 90s and, you know, where they tried to tell a story of this one white kid who's adopted by a ninja family. And they're also cornball. Uh, Hey, I really did that. I really did that. Make a movie of what it was really like. I mean, it was much better than these corny, funny ninja movies that... uh, you know, people, uh, make and, uh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, make a good movie, make a good movie. So here you are, you've gotten your hands on some judo books and you and your friends are trying to work through them because there's no schools in Dayton, Ohio. What happens next? Because I'm sure you don't just hop on a plane after a couple years of that and go to Japan. No, no. Um, I, uh, you know, the next really fun- you know, important part was I went to uh, look for colleges in the mid 1960s. And I had picked a couple of colleges in Ohio and I went to Miami University. And the guide taking, you know, my friend and I around, we saw this person in a white gi walking uh, in the gym. Well, man, I grabbed this guy. I said, who? What is that? What? Oh, he's he's on the judo team. Judo at Miami University. That did it right there. I'm going to Miami University. And uh, uh, my friend who became my roommate, um, he went to Miami University. 
Well, it turns out in the fall when we showed up at Miami, they don't have a judo team. Uh, this guide was wrong. There was a Tang Sudo, Korean karate, uh, private teaching by a commander in the Navy. Now, this is back when we were in Vietnam and they had ROTC on campus and it was strictly for the Navy midshipmen. And, uh, oh, man, you know, I was a theater major. I was about as far away from being a Navy midshipman as you could be. And anyway, I managed to uh, talk this commander into allowing me to study, even though I wasn't a Navy midshipman. That was quite a sales job. And uh, I began training in Tang Sudo. And uh, yeah, I just, you know, I had like 18 years of pent up desire to study. I think I was the best student they ever had. I went to all kinds of classes. My parents really worried, you know, they, well, we didn't send you there a major in karate, you know, and, uh, but I, uh, took all those classes and within three years, uh, I had a, achieved a black belt in, uh, Tang Sudo, uh, Korean karate. Uh, yeah, I just loved it. I just loved it. Mm. So you, at this point, you've kind of realized that childhood dream of learning martial arts, and now you have a black belt, and shortly after, a degree in theater, it sounds like? <laughs> yeah, well, my senior year, I had a black belt, so I helped teach classes and uh, uh, started to discover, you know, there's a, like a big world out there. There are all these styles of martial arts and people who run the different styles and all this kind of thing. Um, I taught uh, karate. Uh, by now, it became a phys ed class at Miami University. We had huge classes, huge classes of people. Uh, I graduated from Miami in 1971. And uh, man, I, I, I've got to find a way to do this full time. And, uh, uh, I eventually started a small karate school. I mean, I was totally unqualified. I think I was like a second degree black belt at that point. I was really unqualified, but it was too important to me. I, I had to do this. And, uh, you know, by 1975, a bunch of political things happened in Korea. Um, not important to go into, but the Korean government nationalized the martial arts in an attempt to uh, get it into the Olympics. And so they all agreed on Taekwondo. We'll call it Taekwondo. And they had some made up forms and that left the Tang Sudo people out in the cold. And I got lost in the shuffle. So I was without a teacher. Um, and, uh, decided based on having read, uh, a book about the ninja, I was going to go to Japan and find this ninja teacher and, uh, become a student. Um, uh, I was going to go to Japan. I was going to do that. So how long did it take you to realize that? You, you've got me on pins and needles here. I don't, I'm not usually like this as I'm speaking with someone. I feel like you're, you've got me eating out of your hand. Maybe that's the intention. Maybe that's how you're presenting this, but it's working. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, okay, it's working. I'm, in, I'm entranced. Well, how how know, do we get from there to Japan? Well, um, it was crazy. Now, remember, this is 1975. There's no Internet. There's no email. Um, I sent letters to uh, just, you know, to Noda City. I figured it's a little tiny city in Japan to this guy. And I never got a reply. I had the letters translated into Japanese. I had studied Japanese for a year at Miami University, my senior year. I, you know. But, uh, you know, so I could speak a little bit of Japanese and I could read and write it um, without the, uh, you know, extensive kanji. Uh, uh, so, you know, I had like a first grade, <laughs> first grade education in Japanese. And uh, it just was 
you know, in the mid seventies in the martial arts, no, I mean, there was no such thing as Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Uh, um, karate was the hot thing. And, uh, you know, there, we didn't have any seniors. The seniors were people like Chuck Norris and Joe Lewis, uh, Mike Stone, who were all in their 20s. Um, we didn't have any old people. So we all trained like young, aggressive uh, contest winners. And I, I was always interested. I mean, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed that. But what I really was interested in was uh, – Back to me being a kid. How do I step in? Somebody's being bullied. They're being picked on, maybe by even more than one person. How do I step in and get that resolved in the most dignified manner possible? And that that, that just wasn't a priority in karate at the time. It, you know, it was uh, these contests and uh, young people training vigorously uh i i needed a some kind of senior um so i went all around america trying to find teachers and you know looking for ways to uh bring this about i i just couldn't find anybody that really talked my language so i just held my breath and bought a ticket to japan on an airliner and went over there um you know i mean now looking back uh, it was crazy i couldn't even read signs in japanese i couldn't even look things up in the yellow pages um what did i expect you know i arrived in tokyo uh haneda airport the sun was coming up and then it really hit me i have no idea where i'm going um and uh miracles happened just miracles happened um i ran into an english speaking guy uh in the train station um i went into tokyo to the train station and he guided me down to iga iga ueno the homeland of the ninja and so i took uh you know bullet train to catch a little local train to catch a little spur train and uh finally made it to iga and no, they didn't have any ninja training anymore. Uh, that was their history, but it was just a tiny little uh, out-of-the-way town. And uh, But people took me on a tour. They took me through this, these neighborhoods where I could see on the uh, mailboxes, you know, famous ninja family names, but they weren't ninja anymore. Uh, I was so, uh, you know, disappointed. I saw a museum. They had a little museum there. Now, that little museum has become quite a tourist attraction since I wrote, you know, these books. And, I mean, huge tourist attraction. And they have ninja shows and everything now. But back in those days, no, it was a tiny little obscure museum. And I got back on the train and I went to try to find this guy named Hatsumi in this Noda city. And that was way north east of tokyo and again just miracles happen uh i found my way there um i arrived late late at night tiny little town and uh everybody's staring at me you know nobody saw foreigners out in this area and uh i asked if there was a hotel and everybody just laughed uh you know oh gosh and there was a girl on the train who spoke very good English. And she said, well, we don't have hotels out here. We have Ryokan. These are like little inns. And uh, I know of an inn behind the railroad station. My boyfriend is coming to pick me up. We can take you to this inn. Oh, man. So I got to the inn and I checked in and uh, a little inn and so I was talking to the innkeeper, this little old lady, and she says, what are you doing in Noda City? You know, And I said, well, I came here to study ninjutsu. Oh, she just cracked up, you know. It'd be like, you know, somebody in uh, going to Bristol, England today saying, oh, yeah, I'm here to study the uh, mystical 
teachings of Merlin the wizard, you know, here in uh, modern Bristol, England. Uh, oh, gosh, you know, that was just something we made up in a funny story, uh, you know, or like somebody's coming from Japan and they come to like Dayton, Ohio. And yeah, I'm here to study with Batman. <laughs> you know, it was just unheard of. And so I said, yeah, this guy, Masaki Hatsumi. And uh, she says, well, I know Masaki Hatsumi, but he's not a ninja. And I said, what is he? He's, a, he's like a therapist. Hey, and that's what I read in the book. He was a therapist. Um, really? Yeah. Yeah. I said, uh, uh, she's, but he's not a ninja. And she says, I, I mean, I've known him since he was born. His mother and I are childhood friends. I mean, what are the odds? You know, I end up in an inn run by a childhood friend of the mother of the guy I'm trying to track down. And I'm amazed. She said, oh, yeah, I can give him a call, you know. And uh, <laughs> really, I mean, just magical stuff like this happened. And she called him up and he came over in about a half hour. And uh, we discussed. I thought I'd have to, like, prove myself and uh, go through all these tests i even brought a back in those days um mid 70s everybody wore polyester suits so i i stuffed a polyester suit in my duffel bag and it came out without any wrinkles you know that was what was nice about polyester suits so i had a suit and tie on to meet this guy and uh um he said oh yeah you can uh, start tomorrow night <gasps> i can you're not going to like test me out or make me wait outside the dojo or anything. No, no, no. You can just come on in. And, uh, so my, my training began. Now here's one funny story. Uh, years later, years later, I got married in Japan and, uh, years later I was back in America and we had one of the seniors, you know, these were guys in their 20s when I was in my 20s, and uh, he was a Japanese military man, and he was over, and my wife, Rumiko, said, oh, yeah, Stephen was so honored, you know, that you guys would accept him so easily, and this guy looks at her kind of funny and says, is, is that what he thought happened? And she goes, what? What? Oh, uh. You know, she told him I was so honored to be accepted as a trainer. She said, oh, no, no. I said, in our generation, he's a pretty big guy. And so the headmaster said, hey, let's bring this big guy in. We'll try all our techniques on him. After about three or four days, he'll be so fed up. He'll leave and then we can go back to training. <laughs> I didn't know that. I didn't know that. I just stayed on for years. <laughs> you, you were an imported Uki, a throwing yes. dummy. Guy, you bet. Yeah. And I mean, the training was rough, but it was stuff that I'd never seen before. I mean, it was all this grappling and, you know, scrambling around on the ground and, you know, a sword would be pulled out. And uh, and even the striking was so different from karate. Uh, it was just overpowering. I just unbelievable. Man, I'm totally committed. Um and, you know, not all the Japanese guys like me. Um, some of them told the headmaster, hey, you shouldn't be showing this to a foreigner. You know, by now I'm sticking around. I'm actually taking part in classes and learning. And, you know, apparently the headmaster didn't agree with them. I mean, not everybody liked me. And uh, uh, there was one time I remember I had to hold a pose with my arm out, my fist out. And this one guy just practiced smashing my fist out of the way, you know, one hit after another. And then, I mean, it was totally made up. No way I'm going to stand there with my fist out. And this guy's just whacking away. So after about three of these hits, I learned how to move my arm just tiny little bit so that the impact was reduced. And then I'd let my arm fly out of the way like this guy had really hit me. And. But I remember thinking, you son of a gun. Uh, I didn't think actually those words. I thought rougher words. <laughs> and uh, You son of a gun. I'm going to get everything that you have and more. And I, that was that was the 
tone of my whole time in Japan. Uh, you know, you think I'm some funny guy. Uh, I'm going to get everything you've got and more. And uh, I believe I did. How long did you spend training there? Well, I was there on a special cultural visa. Um, and I, I stayed there for five years. And then for the next 15 years, um, I was married to a Japanese and we had, we had daughters. And so we would go back two times a year. We'd go back in the fall and the spring all through the eighties and, uh, stay for about a month and a half to train. And then, I mean, like I was way overloaded after that month and a half. And then I'd come back and practice and then go back in the fall. And we did that for about 10 years. And then the nineties came and my girls were now in school and I, I, you know, I couldn't just, they wouldn't let me just pull them out of school. So we would go over in the summer for two or three months every year. And I did that till about all oh, the late 1990s. Um, so, I mean, I was over there every year, but I was not a resident of Japan. So at some point you decide that you want to start teaching again, because you, as you said earlier, you had been teaching. So you're, you come back to the United States and you start teaching what you learned while you were there. Is that how it went or were there more steps in between? Yeah, it, it's an interesting phenomenon because when I uh, came back in 1980, there were the beginnings of uh, like a little ninja boom. Uh, people were interested in ninja. Chuck Norris. Uh, I can't remember the name of the movie now, but he had a ninja movie that he brought out and, you know, these, Spooky Ninja guys were in it. This was in 1980. And uh, um, there was a novel called The Ninja, written by Eric von Lustbader. Uh, there was a beginning of this ninja boom. And I was the only one who had been trained in Japan by lineage holders. Uh, you know, there were a couple other people claiming to be ninja in America, but but I was the only one who had been trained in Japan uh, by a legitimately traceable lineage. And so I became very interesting to Black Belt magazine. I was on the cover of the 1980 Black Belt yearbook. I mean, and I was this unknown guy, but they uh, really, at uh, Black Belt, really took an interest and supported me and they published several of my books and this thing just took off like crazy. Um, I was doing seminars. Um, I didn't have a school. I didn't have a martial arts school. I, I, I needed to be free to come and go and, you know, do different things. And, uh, um, but I didn't even have a job for years. I mean, the book sales, supported me totally i mean i wasn't a billionaire but i mean i could buy a super home out in the woods of you know the countryside and i could take my family back and forth to japan and uh, i didn't even have a job um it was just totally totally remarkable uh but that ninja boom lasted until kind of the end of the 80s and uh I remember by then there were some other people, you know, who were claiming, you know, to be students of this Hatsumi guy and, you know, other people trying to sort of imitate what I was doing. And every two bit karate school had ninja on the window and ninjutsu had, had really become kind of a, uh, uh, you know, a laughing stock, really. Um, just funny little people um, doing this, you know, running around the backyard at night in a black suit. Um, and then Steven Seagal came out with his Aikido movie. And, uh, you know, it captured a lot of people's imagination. And, 
they kind of went on from there and Brazilian jiu-jitsu came in and became very popular. And so I kind of faded into the background at, uh, at that point. But the 80s were uh, just amazing. You know, I did seminars and I was teaching this 15th century Japanese martial art for a little while. But, you know, that was in the heyday of kickboxers and uh, uh, catch as catch can fighters. And I mean, you know, America is really the martial art capital of the world. We have everything. Chinese styles and Korean styles, Indonesian styles, Brazilian style, you know. Um, and everybody who attended the seminar, I mean, there were some sincere people there, but there were a lot of questionable people. You know, they figured I'm the guy on the cover of the, all the magazines. If I beat this guy, I'll be on the cover of all the magazines. So here I am teaching in teacher mode. You know, and some uh, sneaky guy decides he's going to try some technique on me or something like that. Um, it was very uh, dangerous. But, you know, here I am at 68. I uh, I was never, uh, you know, defeated. Uh, I was able to catch on. And, uh, you know, but those 80s were very, very... Uh, wild years for me now i paid attention to my development as opposed to my marketing <laughs> and so when the ninja boom ran out ooh, it ran out and uh so i uh needed to uh find something to do for a living you know uh in the early 90s so what did you shift into doing well as I mentioned, my kids were in school and I couldn't just take them out. Mm. So Rumiko and I decided to open up a martial arts school in Dayton, Ohio. And, and we did that, but, oh, we had to completely revise the curriculum. We had to create beginner lessons for new people who had never done martial arts before. See, all the seminars in the 80s, Everybody came in, they had already had black belts and other martial arts. So what I thought of as the basic lessons really weren't basics at all, but they were, be they were basic lessons for black belts. In fact, there even became a kind of like rumor, oh, you have to have a black belt in some other martial art to study ninjutsu. No, you didn't have to, but that's kind of what it was. Um, and now here we are in Dayton, Ohio, teaching lessons to beginners. We had to completely redo the curriculum. And that's when we created Toshindo. Um, and I'm just delighted. I mean, at, at this time, I'm so happy. You know, people say, well, don't you miss teaching the old classical way? I, I teach a few students, but people don't really want to learn that. They, they want something that is valuable. Um, it provides real crucial lessons for self-defense, but you know, most of my people don't get into multiple fights a year. Um, they're successful business people. Uh, so they can use the lessons and the principles, uh, in their everyday life that changes their life. You know I mean? Studying this martial art, you really become a different human being. Um, it's not something you snap on or strap on um, to learn this. It's a very unusual martial art. Instead of teaching complex techniques, we, in effect, strip away those things that get in the way of people being successful. So it's a minimalist movement, and that's your challenge for the rest of your life. Make it even more minimal, more minimal and producing greater results. Um, and you know, people find this to be of enormous value in their own life, uh, just organizing their homes, running their businesses, running relationships with other people. You become a much more insightful person. Um, we have a series of five elements, earth, water, fire, wind, and you know, what's called the, the void or the emptiness. And, uh, you know, that's, that's, 
classical, but it has to do with kind of how your personality works, which one of these elements is kind of predominant. Oh, people think that's fascinating. Um, you learn not everybody's like me. There are other approaches to life. And how do I, how do I fit in with those other approaches to benefit that person and uh, bring benefit to myself? And that really goes back to the original purpose of the, the ninja, um, how to work my will without the other person being aware at all that I'm involved in this conflict. Uh, the old ninja families, that's why they call them the invisible warriors, because you just didn't know what was going on. Uh, things definitely were taking shape and taking form, but you had no idea that somebody was actually engineering this. And, uh, you know, these are lessons that modern people um, can really take to heart and can uh, use in their, you know, in their everyday life. Awesome. This may go down as one of the most exciting, if not the most exciting first, where, where are we at? Well, 40 plus minutes of an so, episode. I'm absolutely <laughs> transfixed. I just looked at the time and went, wow. But there's more that I want to know. So I want to keep going. And the first thing that I, I'm interested in is, are there things you're interested in outside of martial arts? Because it sounds like very early on, this was sort of your destiny and you realized it. Is there space for things beyond? Well, um, I don't, maybe not a lot of people are aware, but the other thing that really dominated my attention when I was a small child uh, were things that we could say maybe of a spiritual spiritual nature. You know, as a little kid, you know, just questions. Why are human beings here? I mean, what happens when you die? Um, is there any sense to this? Um, and, you know, I was very active in my church when I was a small child, but kind of outgrew those answers. Uh, these were bigger questions. Um, and that has followed me kind of in the background through my whole life. Um, so I became very interested in Japanese spiritual systems when I was in college. You know, I, I read those books. I took courses in philosophy. Um, when I got to Japan, I made connections with these Japanese monks and, uh, uh, early 80s back in America, I met Tibetan monks, and uh, they were much more willing to teach than the Japanese monks. Uh, I think the poor people, their country had been invaded in the 1950s, and they were refugees. Uh, Tibet went to war with China. Oh, man, was that a bad deal. Japan went to war with the U.S. <laughs> what a good deal. You know, we rebuilt their economy and, you know, we left all their temples in place and left the emperor in place. Uh, uh, if you're going to go to war, go to war with the U.S. We'll give you everything, you know. And so the Japanese, I guess, didn't have as much of a need to disseminate. You know, they weren't like fighting to keep their culture so I, I got involved with the Tibetans and uh, uh, did that for 20 years. Um, and uh, not a lot of people know about that. But, I mean, I went to India many times, Nepal several times. Um, I still have very good, dear friends who run monasteries in India and Nepal. And I'm planning to go back, uh, not this year, but next year. Um, and then I've also gotten involved in recent years with a uh, very forward-thinking Japanese uh, Shugendo uh, master. Shugendo is uh, it's called the Yamabushi, the uh, spiritual seekers that go up into the mountains and uh, seek 
answers to big questions from just direct experience in nature. It's not a very intellectual kind of a thing. It's a very experiential thing. And I've gotten, you know, some of my students involved in that as well. And uh, that's about it. I don't, <laughs> I don't have a lot of time for, uh, you know, other things. I collect uh, old automobiles. I enjoy that. I have uh, a couple of uh, classics that uh, my wife wonders, like, when are you going to sell that? You know, <laughs> but uh, I hang on to those. Um, that's maybe a slight interest. Well, I've well, been you, in- you can't mention classic cars and not tell us what you have. <laughs> I can't be the only one listening to this right now. Well, I'm the only one oh. listening right now, but the others listening later will will shoot me. I will get hate mail if I don't ask you what cars you have. Oh, okay. Well, ever since I was a little kid, this stuff all goes back to when I was a little kid, you know, the ninja and uh, spirituality and even cars. When I was a little kid, I was fascinated with Rolls Royce automobiles for some reason. I mean, that grill that looks like a Greek temple. And uh, um, so I have a 19... 19- 88 Rolls Royce Silver Spur that's been, you know, completely restored. And uh, I think it's like the only one in Dayton, Ohio. And, you know, people stare at it when I drive it around. Uh, 88 Rolls Royce. And I have a 1985 long wheelbase uh, Cadillac Fleetwood that is in its original state. It's never been restored. And it's it's like in pristine condition. I bought it new in 1985. Uh, I was this was I was doing uh, like personal security escort for the Dalai Lama of Tibet, and this is before the U.S. government, State Department got involved. And uh, so I bought this car um, just to have uh, to take him around in, and I. I know I'm, you know, I'm 68 years old. I no longer do bodyguard work, but I still have the car. And uh, it's not really a limousine. It doesn't have the glass panel in the middle, uh, but it has extra jump seats. And, uh, you know, my wife and I used to, dr- we had a driver for several years. And uh, so we would take that car around. Uh, that's fun. Uh, yes, yeah, so that's kind of my, uh, and then we, we have some regular, Lexus cars that we just are our daily drivers. And uh, so we had to have a, you know, like a five car garage built to handle all these cars. So that's, you know, that's an interest uh, uh, of mine. But that's it. That's it. Ninja, Shugendo, and Rolls Royce automobiles. <laughs> well, I, I can appreciate the love for cars. And, and I'm curious. Which which gets more crossover? Do you end up looking at, you know, doing kind of car? I'm guessing you have a dojo as well. If you have a five car garage, I'm guessing there's there's a training space. Yeah. In our house. Okay. Uh, you know, when we first built the house, we had our daughters living there and Rumiko's sister was over from Japan to help raise our daughters. And yeah, people coming and going all the time. And it was it, it fit us. Now it's just Rumiko and me. Our girls are living in other cities and have children of their own. And so it's like two little marbles in a, in a packing crate. But uh, uh, we do have a dojo that's built on there. It's like 28 by 26. And, uh, you know, it handle maybe 16 people. Uh, that size. And, yeah, and it, but it's fitted out like a traditional Japanese dojo. Mm. And I do occasional private lessons there. Uh, we live way out in the woods, just outside of Dayton, Ohio, and our woods goes down to the Little Miami River. It's uh, Ohio's first designated scenic river back in the 1960s. So I'm just so blessed. You know, I really am. I'm just so blessed the way I get to live my life. Uh, I deal with the people that I like to deal with. And if there are people I don't like to deal with, I just don't deal with them. You know, <laughs> so I mean, it's just wonderful to be able to say to somebody, you know, I'm just not your guy. 
goodbye. <laughs> you know, and I hang out with all oh, my staff here at the dojo. They're all wonderful people, beautiful, uh, transformative individuals. They get my message. You know, they're all half my age, but you know, they deliver those kind of lessons to people. Um, and I have a series of friends around the country that run, you know, I'm kind of like Colonel Sanders, you know, uh, these people have dojos and they use my image and my curriculum. And we've got maybe 30 Toshindo schools around the world. And Rumiko and I go there and do long weekend advanced teachings. And every one of them is beautiful, beautiful people, um, creeps and insecure thug types, uh, big mouths. They, they're just not attracted to what we're doing. Uh, I'm, I'm just so fortunate for that. Everybody's a beautiful person, very, very capable martial artist. Uh, so we're small, uh, small network. You know, when you think about me doing this for almost 40 years, but, you know, creepy people just don't last. Creepy people just don't last in this martial art. I love that. That's great. And that says a lot about your authenticity with what you're bringing to your teaching and how you select the people around you. One of the things that I am certainly not the first one to say or anywhere close, but one of my favorite quotes, the notion that you are the average of the people you spend your time with. Some, some people put a number on it, the five people you spend the most time with. And it sounds like you've been diligent about making sure the people around you are on a similar path. So you don't have to stray. You don't have to make a decision between that relationship and where you're headed. You know, I'm, uh, I'm so lucky. I'm so lucky with that. And I have been, uh, well, in the eighties, I dealt with some question, <laughs> questionable individuals, but I was testing myself out. I wanted to know that I had something that could work. So, you know, I, there were questionable individuals that came in and out of my life back in those days, but I was just testing out my art to see if, make sure that I had something of real value. But, you know, I, ever since the nineties, man, I just less and less time. I think you're absolutely right. You know, we are a product of what we spend time around and I, you know, I'm just so lucky. Uh, we got money. I don't even think about money. Um, we have a beautiful collection of several hundred people right in Dayton that love this martial art and, you know, I find that stimulating. Um, we have schools around the country you can go to L.A. or Tampa or Chapel Hill. I mean, and, you know, very successful schools teaching our Toshindo martial art and all the people are alike. They're all, you know, I mean, they're all very individualistic. But they're all beautiful. Uh, they want to get the essence of this art. And uh, yes, I'm uh, just repeat myself, but yeah, I'm I'm a real blessed individual in that I I just get to hang out where I like to be and where I find it to be most stimulating and most encouraging. Yeah. Well, I can certainly relate to that feeling of being blessed because. I get to train and talk to martial artists and make it part of my job. I mean, what's, you know, it's an yeah. absolutely fantastic thing. So I, I certainly get it. We've spent yeah. a lot of time today talking about good things, really positive things. One of the things that I, I enjoy talking to martial artists about most is actually the other end of the spectrum. The way that martial artists handle adversity. I'd love for you to tell us about a time where things didn't go well and how your martial arts training in whatever way you want to define it allowed you to overcome. Well, now I got to really scratch my head on that one. That is a interesting question. Interesting. I wasn't expecting that. So I have to think I have had several, you know, I mean, I, I emphasize the positive and I don't like to, whine around or complain or bellyache about the negative. So, you know, I deal with that and, you know, I take it as life lessons. So one time there was a guy, he was a, an affiliate 
And he had sort of tricked his way into getting uh, Toshindo school affiliation and just a bad guy, bad guy, uh, didn't understand me, didn't understand what I was teaching. He came from this raging ego standpoint. We were trying to get rid of him, but he had a license that he tricked his way into getting. And uh, he sued me. <laughs> he sued me for you know, an enormous amount of money claiming that I was supporting some other guy in his town uh, instead of him. And the other guy had a poster up in his school that he bought for $10 on the website. You know, anybody could buy these posters, a picture of me and my teacher. And, uh, but, you know, so I said, well, gee, give me four and a half minutes in front of a judge. You know, I'll explain. No, it doesn't work that way. Uh, well, this is crazy, this lawsuit. Uh, this is absolutely, well, you know, every man needs his, uh, you know, uh, moment in court and uh, you know of course all the attorneys are going to vote that way because that's how they make their living you know and oh he sued me in his town and it was just infuriated me you know made me very angry that I had to take my time to deal with this nut but um, I talked to one of my Tibetan friends a uh, Tibetan monk friend in New York City and he said to me he said I got swindled once. I said, you did. Somebody swindled a Tibetan monk. Well, it's New York, you know. I said, okay. He says, yeah, it was a computer thing. And I was out $2,000. And, uh, you know, I was out $2,000. And he wasn't going to make it right. And so he says to me, I figure you pay that much money for a lesson. You better learn a lot from it. <laughs> so, huh, Okay. I'll learn from this lesson. So I went back and uh, got involved with an attorney and we played these attorney games with this guy. And uh, turns out um, we kind of tricked him into a uh, settlement thing where he didn't win. Uh, no, I still had to pay my attorney, but no, you pay that kind of money, you learn a good lesson. So that's the way I handle that. Um, I got the opportunity to be egregiously sued, and I learned a whole lot, you know, about the uh, justice system and how to work in that whole world. So uh, uh, maybe that was my ninja ingenuity. Uh, I tapped into and turned that into a, a learning opportunity, shall we say. Your ninjanuity. <laughs> I couldn't let that one go by. That was too easy. Yeah, yeah. I and love I, I love the idea of that, the, that you, you know, took what you could from it. And it's something that I think is maybe not articulated as well as you just did, but it's it's a common occurrence in our martial arts training, isn't it? The idea that, you know, we fall, we falter, and it's from all of those mistakes that we slowly piece together, not necessarily what is right, but at least what will work. You know, I think that's really true. Um, the older we get, uh, the more experiences we have. So a very young person, you know, would be, kind of, uh, you know, just starting out isn't going to have those, all those experiences. So I find lots of experience is very important, but it's also matched by an extremely bright, uh, awareness. I'm aware of what I'm going through. I'm changing as a human being. Uh, I went through that lawsuit. I changed as a human being. Am I changing in a way that is going to make me a happier, more fulfilled human being? Or am I becoming a little more cynical, a little more bitter? Uh, that, oh, that's very important. How to come out of something like that with a bigger storehouse of knowledge, a brighter sense of who I am. So awareness on one hand and lots of experience on the other hand, uh, that's, the, that's the key for growth. That's the key for growth. 
If you had the opportunity to train with anyone that you haven't, anywhere in the world, anywhere in time, who would you want to train with? Oh, geez. Um, is this like a uh, anytime, anywhere? You kind name of- it. Yeah. Any, anybody, I, I guess we'll put the qualification on them that they have to be a real person. Yeah. They have to I- have existed. You know, I think it would be fascinating to get in my time machine, you know, and go back and experience uh, Miyamoto Musashi. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, f- for people unfamiliar with the Japanese martial arts, this guy lived in the 1600s and uh, he had like 60 duels to the death. Uh, he started out as a uh, abused kid, you know, I mean, uh, abused kid. He was angry and uh, 60 duels. And toward the end, he just fought with a wooden sword. I mean, he was fighting people with razor sharp steel swords, but he just had a wooden sword. And at the very end of his life, he uh, retreated to a cave. Now, you can see this cave from my uh, wife's house in Kumamoto. And we've been to the cave several times. And he wrote his treatise on uh, fighting, the Book of Five Rings, the earth, water, fire, wind, and void. And uh, he wrote this down. Uh, I mean, he didn't write it down. He did, dictated it. Someone wrote it down. And, uh, you know, then he died. But I think, you know, these stories of this Musashi and how he evolved uh, into, you know, a pretty spiritual guy at the very end. He was carving these Buddhist deities in his cave, and uh, um, he really got a whole lot about what life was like by facing, and, and he didn't do it in, like, not all these were honorable duels. Sometimes he had to sneak up on people, like gangs would be against him and so forth. Uh, yeah, I'd say I'd love to go back in time and hang out with Miyamoto Musashi. That that would be awesome. And if half, you know, it's been a little while since I read the book, but if even half or, or a third of what is in that book is true, it's still mind boggling. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really, really. And to think those that story has been handed down for. Uh, what, 500 years? Yeah. 500 years that story has been handed down? That's amazing. It's amazing. Mm. Yeah. Makes you wonder what stories from now will be told in 500 years. Don't you wonder about yeah. that? Yes, yes, yes. Now, you've mentioned your books, and we just talked about a book, so maybe this is a good time to talk about books in general. Tell us about some of the books that you've written and some of the books that you've read beyond book of five rings that you might recommend to the folks listening? Well, I'm, uh, not a very well read person. Um, my mom, when I was tiny, she used to buy me storybooks, but she said I was only interested in, in mechanical, how to do it kind of books. And, uh, she was a little, a little disappointed, uh, I've written 22 books now since 1978 and uh, the original book, the ninja and their secret fighting art. It's it, it was recently uh, cover redesigned Tuttle company still sells that book <laughs> since 1978. And uh, we put a new cover on it and I did a new introduction. Uh, that's the story of how I went to Japan and and began to study this ninja martial art. And it's one of my favorite books, uh, even to this day. Uh, You know, I think people find it interesting because I I weave stories. Now, I'm the butt of the joke in a lot of the stories. Um, And then the stories turn into teaching methods. And I think that's one of the reasons that that book has been so popular over the years. It's... uh, you know, it's not just how to do it. It, uh, it gives some of my motivations and people can identify with those motivations maybe. Uh, and then my newest book is, uh, 
well, it's available on Amazon as an ebook, and we have some, you know, bound books that we sell on our website. But it's called it's called Vajra Kilaya, Vajra Kilaya, Heart of Light, Blade of Thunder, and it's the story. It starts in 1993 when I'm traveling with the Dalai Lama, and I recapture the same kind of writing style. There are 36 chapters in the book, and I start each chapter with a little story involving me and the Dalai Lama or some other lamas and how I got involved in this uh, Dorje Purba or uh, Kilaya. It's a, it's a, a spiritual dagger, a three-sided dagger that's used for spiritual purposes in uh, obscure Tibetan <laughs> lore. And so it teaches, it starts with a story, and then it teaches a little bit about it, and then each chapter ends with a series of questions where the reader can kind of compare his or her life and, and so forth as to the uh, lesson that's just gone by. And uh, so I'm enjoying uh, trying to promote that book right now. It's available on Amazon. I mean, easiest way for people to find that if they're interested, um, black belt bodyguard for the Dalai Lama kind of book. Well, you, you know, and it's 300 pages and no little pictures of black guys in suits fighting. Or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can go to, you can go to Amazon and just type in Stephen K Hayes and it'll, it'll come up with, you know, my, uh, all my books there. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And of course, folks, if you're new to the show or, you know, just as a reminder, we do link all this relevant stuff at the show notes, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Don't forget, if you're driving, don't try and write this stuff down. Don't crash. No need. Let's talk about the future. You're still active. You're still training. You're still teaching. You're still writing books. And it's clear from our time today, at least to me, that you're still really passionate about this stuff. Oh, yeah. I long ago made peace with the fact that I'm going to run out of lifetime before I run out of lessons, you know, <laughs> have to come back again and start over again. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just so uh, happy. Uh, uh, I'm trying to decide whether to tell this story or not. So anyway, I guess I'll tell it. I, I recently went. I recently went to my 50th high school reunion, 50th high school reunion. And uh, <laughs> I'm a little depressed at all these old people there, you know. <laughs> you know? Oh, yeah, I'm retired. You're retired. What do you do? Oh, well, we're, you know, I, I read a lot. And, uh, uh, oh, God, this sounds awful. <laughs> Just last night, I was wrestling teenagers with knives on the floor. <laughs> these, these people are retired and, uh, you know, kind of old and out of shape. And, you know, I remember the high school big shots, you know, the athletes. Oh, gosh, they've all got guts on them now. <laughs> you know, and the, the gorgeous girls were little old ladies now. And, uh, oh, man, you know, I came away from that 50th high school reunion uh oh boy i'm a lucky guy aren't i i'm i'm still in the game i'm still in the game uh, but you know i think i think you know there is some truth to that i spend all my time with people in their 20s and 30s i i forget i'm 68 um and so i you know i'm i'm kind of used to the way young people think, oh, I don't always agree with it, you know, but I'm, I'm used to the way young people think. And it's very refreshing to be involved with people who are, I mean, totally engaged, just starting out in life. Um, and I'm there as an advisor. I'm there as a participant. Um, so, yeah, I think that is, uh, you know, my passion for the martial arts and the spiritual arts. Um, uh, as I say, I'm going to run out of lifetime before I run out of lessons. And, uh, you know, my mom is 94. 
She lives in Phoenix. Impeccable shape. I mean, I get on Skype with her. She's all dressed up, uh, very clear thinking, 94. So I figure that bodes well for me. I figure I got another 30 years here in the game and uh, got to make the best of it, you know? Absolutely. I love the approach. I love the the openness to just what you've what you said there just a couple times you're going to run out of life before you run out of lessons. And really if we're being honest, we all will regardless of how long we live. You know there are always more lessons. You know that is true. It's just when do you check out of the game? When do you just give it all up and uh uh, man, I just hope I never do. I just hope I never do. And that's kind of a universal sentiment among the guests that we've had on, especially those guests that have been training for 30, 40, 50 plus years. Folks that look back on their life and say, you know, it feels like this just started. I'm still passionate about training. I'm still passionate about teaching. I'm still learning lessons. And I hope that that everyone out there listening can take some inspiration from that and realize that it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter what you've done, there's always more to learn. And don't take any moments, whether they're the moments now or the moments later, for granted, because you want to make the most of them. You want to use them in the best way you can. Very well put. Well, thank Very. you. Thank you. I, I, I had to get a couple good good things in on, on this one. You know, you've you've set the bar so high. I had to rise to the occasion. <laughs> well, it's been delightful talking with you. I've really enjoyed this opportunity to be on the Whistle Kick podcast. Uh, well, thank thoroughly you for being enjoyed here. it. Thank you for being here. If I could poke you for just kind of one last bit, one golden nugget of wisdom to wrap it up at the end, what parting words would you leave for everyone listening? Oh, you know, I think. Um, this is kind of mundane, but it's not mundane. But really, why are you involved in the martial arts? Why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? I went through two major changes of martial arts because I just kept asking myself that question. Is this martial art that I'm doing right now, is it satisfying totally why I'm in the martial arts? And if it's not, this is America. Go out and Hey, you know, thank your teacher, but, you know, move on, look around. Uh, I don't think enough people ask themselves, you know, they may remember why they got started, but no, now, why are you in the, why are you doing this? Why is this rewarding? What benefit does it bring to you? Is it possible you could get more of that benefit by being a little open-minded, looking around, trying something, uh, trying something new, or maybe your current martial art totally satisfies you, but take stock, take stock. Why are you doing what you're doing and allow that to inspire you? I found Anshu Hayes to be a dynamic storyteller along with his funny stories, which made the interview that much more enjoyable for me. I felt I was right there with him on parts of his journey. I'm sure that many of you who are listening right now have been inspired by not only his humility, but his perseverance to learn not just any martial art, but one that's so difficult to learn, even difficult to find someone to teach. His inspiring story shows both his eagerness to learn and his dedication to the martial arts. Anshu Hayes, thank you for coming on the show. This is where you should check out whistlekickmartialartsradio.com for the links to Anshu Hayes' websites, social media, our social media, we're at Whistlekick all over the place, other episodes, signing up for the newsletter, and so much more. We put a lot into this show, and we hope that you enjoy it. And the best compliment we could ever receive from you is to share this or any of the other episodes with your fellow martial arts friends. Let them know that you enjoy the show and help us support not only the show, but the martial arts overall as we chronicle the stories of some of these amazing folks. As always, I appreciate your time today and lending me your ears. I hope all goes well. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.